Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you with us. We're beginning a new series of lessons. This is a lesson, series of lessons that we'll be studying for the months of April, May, and June of 2013. And it will be a very interesting series on the minor prophets of the Old Testament. Those are those 12 little books that sometimes don't get much mention, but they have some very important spiritual lessons, and I think we'll discover that over the next few weeks. This is lesson number one for April 6, and it's entitled Spiritual Adultery, and we're starting off with the longest one of those minor prophet books called Hosea. It has some very interesting things to say to us. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer, and then I'd like to encourage you to grab your Bibles, open up to the book of Hosea right after those big prophets, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, then comes Hosea. Um, and we'll have a very interesting time together. But let's pray right now. Our kind and loving Father, as we turn to your inspired record and we look at the incredible experiences of your friend Hosea, may we learn the lessons, the very important lessons which are here for us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To understand the minor prophets, you really need to have a little idea of the background what was going on at that time. Hosea prophesied in the middle of the 8th century BC. He probably started around 855, somewhere, I'm, I'm sorry, 755 or so, down to probably the demise of the, the northern kingdom of Israel in 722, 7, 723, 722, we're counting down. Um, of Samaria and the Northern Kingdom. That's, of course, all before Christ. And to, to give us a little idea what was going on at this desperate time in the history of, of Israel, I'd like us to read a few verses from 2 Kings chapter 17. And I really don't see how you can understand the book of Hosea without looking at this material first. But um, it wasn't recommended in our study guide, but I would recommend that you have a look. Then Shalmaneser invaded Israel and besieged Samaria. We're looking at 2 Kings chapter 17, beginning with verse 5. In the third year of the siege, imagine what it would be like to be cramped up in a small Hebrew city with basically no food for three years, which was the ninth year of the reign of Hosea, the Assyrian emperor, captured Samaria, took the Israelites to Assyria as prisoners, and settled some of them in the city of Hala, some near the river Habor, and the district of Gozan, and some in the cities of Media. So the, the people, the children of Israel, used to be living in the northern kingdom of Israel, are now scattered in the east. Samaria fell, and here's where we need to start paying careful attention. Samaria fell because... Does it say because Shalmaneser had a very powerful force that he attacked them with? That's not what it says. It says Samaria fell because the Israelites sinned against the Lord their God, who had rescued them from the king of Egypt and who had led them out of Egypt. And we all know about that, that story. They worshipped other gods. Now look at the list of things they did wrong. They worshipped other gods. They followed the customs of the people whom the Lord had driven out as his people advanced and adopted customs introduced by the kings of Israel. And that started, remember, when Jeroboam built those two gold calves for them to worship. The Israelites did things that the Lord their God disapproved of. They built pagan places of worship in all their towns, from the smallest village to the largest city. Pagan places of worship. On all the hills and under every shady tree, they put up stone pillars and images of the goddess Asherah. Now, she's the female uh, fertility goddess, the, the consort of Baal, who is the male fertility god. Uh, and they burnt incense on all the pagan altars, following the practice of the people whom the Lord had driven out of the land. They aroused the Lord's anger with all their wicked deeds and disobeyed the Lord's command not to worship idols. I, I don't have enough fingers to keep counting. You can count for me. The Lord had sent his messengers and prophets to warn Israel and Judah, abandon your evil ways and obey my commands, which are contained in the law I gave to your ancestors and which I handed on to you through my servant, the servants, the prophets. But they would not obey. 
They were stubborn like their ancestors who had not trusted in the Lord their God. They refused to obey his instructions. They did not obey, in other words. They did not keep the covenant he had made with their ancestors, and they disregarded his warnings. Now, what kind of a relationship do we have going here between the Israelites and God? Bad. It's pretty grim. Now, did the Israelites think that they were worshiping God? Well, sort of yes and no. Uh, basically, they were going back and forth between worshiping at the temple in, in well, it wasn't Jerusalem in those days. Now, they're, they, they don't even have a temple in the northern kingdom, of, uh, a, a true temple in the northern kingdom of Israel. They're, they're doing nothing but pagan worship. Was worshiping God maybe a window dressing, or did they not even do that? And Some of them and, pretended. And so it was a, an amalgamation of... Uh, Mostly the worshiping the fertility cult gods. We'll talk more about that as we go along. But they didn't have a, a sudden, forget God, I'm going after Baal. No. It, it, as I understand it, it started like in Solomon's day where he, where he took in some, some, uh, some wives and Princesses. some other people and basically said, we need to we need to be friends with these people. We need to understand their culture. We need to, and perchance we will win them if we if we're part part of them. And then they just go on and and it be, and, and it deteriorates. Became, it became really severe in the days of Ahab and Jezebel because Jezebel's father was a priest of Baal yeah. from Sidon. And she came with this specific intention of introducing her God to the children of Israel. And this is the result. Well, what, what did they do to make all this happen? What they, did they do? They worshiped the Israel. Things. Israel. I mean, first, first what happened, there was a split between north and south. Yes. Mm. And, so, and so you had the northern kingdom, you had the southern kingdom. Mm -hmm. Then you had the kings and kingdom in the north that was jealous of the southern kingdom because they had the temple in Jerusalem. So you had you had these kingdom, kings of the north um, premeditatively trying to get this their population to not to go to go to Jerusalem. God anymore. Mm -hmm. The, they, that's why they, what they're trying to do politically, they were trying to get the people to stay north and to go to a different type of religion. That's mm -hmm. what they were trying to do. Yeah. That, so that's how it, now, now, when that, now when that started, you know, when the split started, the, the southern kingdom was going to go up and fight them and bring them back. But God said, don't do it. This is my, I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't do that. So you got this split here. You got all this stuff happening. And it sounds like God did it. Well, God said, basically, he said, you know, do uh, whatever you can to stay away from this pagan stuff that's going on in the north. That's what he said to the people in the south. And remember, and it, looks like, it looks like the, um, the kings did not want it, them to do that. That they, they, actually, they, they actually tried to get them not to come down to the, the that southern is correct. part. They didn't want, they, they were afraid that if the people from the north kept going to worship at the temple in Jerusalem in the south, that some of them would say, well, man, it's a lot nicer over there. You know, why are we sticking with this nonsense in the north? Let's, let's go back and, and join the people in the south. But, yeah. but I see something else is happening. It seems like Israel was always following God according to their leaders. Most of the time, that's correct. And it looks like God was trying to get them for the first time to individually, um, individually worship God apart from what their leaders say. Well, I mean, what else, what would you do if you were God? And the leaders are going downhill as fast well, as you can well, go. Well, what if he needed, what, he, what if he needed to have his people individually come to him instead of coming as a group according to the, what their leaders wanted them to do. Well, you know, that's what it looks like to me that's happening here. Yeah. Well, what happened in actual fact is what it says in the next section, the last part of verse 15 of 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, of 2 Kings 17. 
They worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. And they followed the customs of the surrounding nations, disobeying the Lord's command not to imitate them. Now, that's God's description of them. What do you think this they is, were thinking? Yeah, well, let, let's be honest here. This is the description in Second Kings. This is the political kings. The, first and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings were probably written, people think they were, they were probably written by um, Jeremiah. Not sure of that, but that's a possibility. But these are, these, are, these are not the mainly spiritual emphasis books. The spiritual emphasis stuff and what's going on with the temple, that's in Chronicles. Okay, I, but yeah. when the people are doing this, mm -hmm. what is their spiritual mindset? Yeah. What, what are they thinking when they, when they go off to this? Are they thinking, my land, we're just doing what God doesn't want us to do and we're so happy? No. Or are they, are they rationalizing well, well, one their thing health? I'm sure it was happening. Their leaders are telling them that to worship these idols. That's what yeah. they were saying. All, and all, then, you, then you look at Elijah. He comes in and he says, how long are you going to be between two ideas here? Pick one or the other. Yeah. And, and it's just like they were vacillating between doing what God wanted them to do, what they knew what God wanted them to do, and what the leaders were telling them to do. And it's kind of hard. And that message was way back in the northern kingdom when it first separated not by Elisha, but I mean, I'm sorry, but not even before it first separated, that was a message from Joshua way back at the end of his life. You know, the bottom line, is it that they fell out of love with God? They mm -hmm. fell out of love with God's ways? Mm -hmm. uh, would it be like if we fell out of love with being an Adventist? Well, or, hold on. We're I gonna, mean, and, yeah. and the people around them seem to be having more fun, and so they incorporated some of that fun sure. into their ways. Well, listen, it's going to spell that out in detail. They broke all the laws of the Lord. I'm reading now verse 16. They broke all the laws of the Lord their God and made two metal bull calves. That was Jeroboam's doing, Jeroboam 1, uh, to worship. They also made an image of the goddess Asherah. That's a fertility goddess. Worship the stars and serve the god Baal, the male fertility god. They sacrifice their sons and daughters as burnt offerings to pagan gods. Does that sound like fun? Mm. They consulted mediums and fortune tellers. They devoted themselves completely to doing what is wrong in the Lord's sight and so aroused his anger. The Lord was angry with the Israelites and banished them from his sight, leaving only the kingdom of Judah. But even the people of Judah did not obey the laws of the Lord their God. They imitated the customs adopted by the people of Israel. The Lord rejected all the Israelites, punishing them and handing them over to the cruel enemies until at last he had banished them from his sight. After the Lord had separated Israel from Judah, the Israelites made Jeroboam son of Nebat their king. Jeroboam made them abandon the Lord and led them into terrible sins. That's what you were talking about. They followed Jeroboam and continued to practice all the sins he had committed until at last the Lord banished them from his sight as he had warned through his servants of prophets that he would do. So the people of Israel were taken into exile to, Syria, to Assyria where they still live. That's the background. Now, that's, that's what really happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to ascertain what was going on in the mm -hmm. mind of, of, of the people. Okay. And it reminds me of Saul mm -hmm. when he's down there with the witch of Endor and uh, getting messages from the devil. And Samuel comes along and says, what's going on here? And he says, you, you've, you've sinned. Oh, no, I, I did exactly what the Lord asked me to do. Mm -hmm. How deluded can you be? Yeah. And, and that's what, I think that's what's going on in the minds of these people. Well, They're that deluded. Right here in Hosea, we're going to read what's going on in the minds of the people. I'm now looking at Hosea chapter 4. I'm going to read from verses 11 to 16. I'm sorry I'm doing a lot of reading here, but I think this background stuff is essential. The Lord says, wine, both old and new, is robbing my people of their senses. So there's a good clue. They ask for revelations from a piece of wood. A stick tells them what they want to know. They have left me like a woman who becomes a prostitute. They have given themselves to other gods. At sacred places on the mountaintops they offer sacrifices, and on the hills they burn incense unto the tall, spreading trees, because the shade is so pleasant. 
Okay. At the same time, were they were they also worshiping at at some? Uh, some of them were. S some of them were worshiping at the place where where they were supposed to, yeah. and some were doing this, and some were doing both. As a result, your daughters serve as prostitutes, your daughters-in-law commit adultery. Yet I will not punish them for this, because you yourselves go off with temple prostitutes. I mean, what do you think is happening here? And together with them, you offer pagan sacrifice. As the proverb says, a people without sense will be ruined. Even though you people of Israel are unfaithful to me, may Judah not be guilty of the same thing. Don't worship a Gilgal or Beth Haven or make promises there in the name of the Lord, living God. The people of Israel are as stubborn as mules. How can I feed them like lambs in a meadow? And we'll see what God's response is a little bit later when we, we get to that point in the story. So you can see that the situation was terrible. And I'm just going to give a little more historical background. The people, the period of Hosea's prophetic activity, as dated according to the reigns of four, and this is Hosea 1, 1 and following, according to four kings in Judah, mentioned in Hosea 1, 1, Uzziah, 792 to 740, Jotham, 757 31, Ahaz, 735 to 715, and these, these were overlap because quite often the kings would take a son in and train them to be king before they passed on, and Hezekiah, 729 to 686, and the reign of Jeroboam II, 793 to 753 BC, in the northern kingdom of Israel. Also on the throne during Hosea's ministry were the last six kings of Israel following Jeroboam II, Zechariah, Shalom, Menahem, Pekahiah, Pekah, and Hosea, although, they're, although they are not listed in Hosea 1. A dating which satisfies all the demands of the historical notations in Hosea 1 is about 755 to 725 BC, which was the darkest period of Israel's history. Following the death of Jeroboam II, the nation was in a state of political anarchy. Of the last six kings of Israel, four, Zechariah, Shalom, Pekahiah, and Pekah, were assassinated. And the other two, Menahem and Hosea, ascended the throne through, via assassinations. I mean, what's going on in this nation? Morally speaking, Israel was bankrupt. Blatant immorality were, were, immoralities were practiced openly and unashamedly. The religious life of the people was idolatrous and degenerate. Hosea was an eyewitness to the inward deterioration which eventually led to the collapse of the nation in 722 BC, at which time Samaria, the capital, fell to the Assyrians. Hosea's ministry overlapped those of Isaiah and Micah in Judah, in the southern kingdom, and Amos in, the, in, in, in Israel. These four prophets of the 8th century constituted the high mark of Hebrew prophecy. Things were desperate, and God has sent four prophets at one time to try to, to get people to wake up. Where does it say in the Bible that... Um, if you want to believe a lie, in other words, you don't have a love for the truth, God will send strong delusions. Yeah. So if you don't want to really believe God, mm -hmm. he's just going to let your mind go and let you think these terrible things are right. I mean, what a horrible uh, thing to have a God to give up on your mind and let you go into strong delusions. And what you see is if you look at the history of just the, the kings in the northern kingdom, there is, there is not a single one of those kings that's described in the Bible as good. Now, in the southern kingdom, there were some bad kings and some good kings, and it went a little bit like this. They were sort of going down gradually, but at least there were a few good kings. In the northern kingdom, there's not one. It was just <laughs> down, down slope. Now, were these prophets appreciated, these four that were going around and saying, hey, you're not doing well? No. Okay. So, and this is even four prophets that are named, that we have record of, that we have their writings. There may have been many others that we, whose writings we don't have. And remember that in the Northern Kingdom, as the Northern Kingdom is first getting started, what two very important prophets, well-known prophets, ministered in the northern kingdom. The one prophet that pulled their beards when they didn't obey? Is that no, no, that's oh, later. Okay, that's later. Okay. The first two very important, well-known prophets were Elijah and Elijah. They were prophets sent to the northern kingdom. They didn't minister in the southern kingdom. They ministered in the northern kingdom. 
And that was, of course, in the days of, well, initially in the days of Ahab and, and Jezebel and then following after them. So what does God do with this picture? Well, a question. Is God actually punishing these people or is it like the Garden of Eden when God said, if you sin, you shall die? Yeah. Which is happening? Is God punishing or are their sins actually punishing themselves? Because by sin, you'll get into all this trouble. Well, let me read the next verse after where I stopped on, in, on Hosea 4. Hosea 4.17, we still need to get back to the story of Hosea. But Hosea 4.17 says, The people of Israel are under the spell of idols. Let them go their own way. God finally says, I'm sorry, there's nothing more I can do for these people. And we'll, 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 we'll see that picture spelled out in a lot more detail as we go along in the next couple well, of lessons. Well, he, he let Eve go her own way. She had freedom of choice also. Yep. That sounds awful lot like he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And you're starting to talk about parallels with another part of the Bible that we're going to focus on here. Well... The book of Hosea doesn't start out with all this background because Hosea and everybody he was writing to in his day, they knew what was going on already. These fertility cult shrines that were everywhere promised that if you worshipped at their shrine, you got involved with their worship, that it, it, the belief was if you do these things, it, your, your crops will grow better, your, your animals will have more babies, etc. And this is a way to get prosperous. And they believe that. And we, I mean, we're, we're talking about, I don't know how graphic we need to get, but the idea was if you had intercourse with these temple virgins, if you will, or whatever you would choose to call them, the temple prostitutes, that was going to make your crops go better. That's, that was the teaching. This was power religion. Did, mm. did they believe it because it was fun and they wanted to believe it? Yes. They wanted to participate? Mm -hmm. I oh. think a lot of it is because of leaders telling them that that this is the way to go. Yeah. I mean, when they built those two calves, the leader came out, the king came out and says, look, these are the, the gods that took you out of Egypt. And they said, what? You know, and, and he just kept saying this kind of stuff. And, and, and what happened as a result? The young man came and said, you're wrong. And he couldn't move his hand and the whole thing. I mean, that's, that should have stopped well, the, the only, whole thing right The there. only problem is that that young man died, mysterious death. And so... Well, mysterious. That, mysterious, mysterious yeah. Well, it wasn't was mysterious. Well, well you, know, you don't think that was mysterious when they walked by and saw this lion sitting there with, with, the, um, donkey? with the donkey right there? That's not mysterious? Well, you know, leaders tell you you have to go along to get along. You have to go along or something's going to happen to you. Um, it's very um, difficult to be um, out of step with the group. So um, I can't fault all the people because maybe they're in survival mode and the, and the leader had a threat over them. Well, it's just, like, it's just like sometimes, you know, we get some emails at LLBN about this Sabbath school here and they said, well, how can you guys just talk whatever you want with all these questions? Because, you know, when I go to Sabbath school, I have to go with what the leader says. <laughs> and I'm seeing a parallel here. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happens. If the leader tells you that you need to believe it this way, or the book says you've got to believe it this way, you've got to believe it There's that way. There's a difference between a leader and, a, and, the, and the Holy Scriptures as a book. And it's well, I'm major, talking about the difference. Sabbath school <laughs> lesson, oh, not well, just the, ba not the Bible. It's difficult to step out. You get uh, picked on. Picked on, you get slapped around, you get whatever. So, I know, okay. it's pretty bad. So here's, here's okay. the way God pictures all this. And he pictures it to try to get people's attention. He pictures it with a lived out parable. And let's read about that now in Hosea 1, starting with verse 2. When the Lord first spoke to Israel through Hosea, he said to Hosea, go and get married. Your wife will be unfaithful. Basically, your wife is going to be a prostitute. And your children will be just like her. 
Did he actually get married to yes. a prostitute? Yes. And the same way my people have left me and become unfaithful. Now, some people read the Hebrew very carefully here and say that she was a prostitute even before Hosea married her. And we need to talk about that. What do you think? Did well, she become a prostitute after he married her? Or? This one says, go take thee a wife of whoredoms, yeah. which would imply she was already one, mm -hmm. or she couldn't have been named that. In light of, but it can be read with God's fore, foreknowledge, a wife who's going to be a whore. That's what yours says, your wife will be unfaithful, mm -hmm. sort of like after you get married. Yeah. But put Ezekiel 16 in it, yeah. and now you're back to Norm's position. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, I mean it's, a, it's more graphic than... Yeah, exactly. If we look at the parallel, the history, mm -hmm. as in verse, uh, at, at the end of the verse, in the same way my people have left me and become unfaithful. Well, the people of Israel were unfaithful the whole time yeah. from before Egypt. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Hosea married a woman named Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim. After the birth of their first child, a son, the Lord said to Hosea, Name him Jezreel, because it will not be long before I punish the king of Israel for the murders that his ancestor Jehu committed at Jezreel. I am going to put an end to Jehu's dynasty. And in the valley of Jezreel, I will at that time destroy Israel's military power. Gomer had a second child. Where was Hosea in this? Well, she may have been doing her, her, her business. Is it saying it's not Gomer and Hosea that had a second child, just Gomer? Yeah. Second and third. This time it was a daughter. The Lord said to Hosea, name her unloved. Imagine calling your daughter unloved. Because I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forgive them. But to the people of Judah I will show love. I, the Lord their God, will save them. But I will not do it by war with swords or bows or arrows or with horses or horsemen. After Gomer had weaned her daughter, she became pregnant again and had another son. The Lord said to Hosea, name him, not my people. <laughs> because the people of Israel are not my people and I am not their God. Now, if you walk around and you say, uh, oh, how are your children? Well, here's the one that represents the fact that his ancestors killed all the former kings of Israel. And this one is called unloved and that one's called not my people. How do you like those names? I mean, I don't know. It might even have got some people's attention. How, how is this being presented? <laughs> I mean, did, is, was Hosea a well-known person? That we would... don't know that. We, th and that's the question I ask. Did, did, if you were Hosea's neighbor, how would you respond to him? Um, if I were his neighbor, I might respond in one way, but how about the person five miles away? Would yeah. they even know? Yeah. And, and we don't so have then the question, if, and that's the qu very good question. That would be my next question. If you were Hosea and this was your story, would you write it out and then stand at the entrance to the temple and say, folks, let me tell you my story? <laughs> I've got well, kids named. <laughs> exactly. You think people. God told him to stand at the temple? Possibly. Well, he, anybody, he who would, anybody who would follow God's order and, and do this, probably standing in the temple is a, is a minor thing. <laughs> yeah. We're speaking of some kind of communication between God and this man. This man, mm -hmm. like Noah, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, Moses, this man had some kind of connection that he was sure that God was telling him to do this. Well, he's a prophet. Yeah. Prophets get told that kind of stuff. It's different than us. Um, I so mean, what's, what, what's happened next? Well, look at chapter 2, verse 2. My children, this is Hosea speaking to his children. My children, plead with your mother, though she is no longer a wife to me, and I am no longer her husband. Plead with her to stop her adultery and prostitution. Now here's Hosea trying to get his children to plead to their mother. If she does not, I will strip her as naked as she was on the day she was born. I will make her like a dry and barren land, and she will die of thirst. I will not show mercy to her children. They are the children of a shameless prostitute. Sounds like revelation. Yeah. For, for I mean, prostitute. Is he, giving these, is he giving God credit for these words? Or is are his, are his children saying... Look what daddy's saying. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? 
I mean, you you can read it as I well mean, as it, I can. It looks like he's saying it. Yeah. Well, I will not show mercy to her children. They are the children of a shameless prostitute. She herself said, I will go to my lovers. They give me food and water, wool and linen, olive oil and wine. So I'm going to fence her in with thorn bushes and build a wall to block her way. And that's how you, how you keep, your, keep your wife at home. <laughs> she will run after her lovers, but will not catch them. She will look for them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I'm going back to my first husband. I was better off then than I am now. She would never acknowledge that I am the one who gave her the corn. Now it's God talking. The corn, the wine, the olive oil, and all the silver and gold that she used, to, used in the worship of Baal and so forth. Well, and so what happens? Drop down to chapter 3. We don't have time to read all of this. Doesn't it say someplace that in the end times the people will search for the word of God and won't find it? Yes. That's sort of like searching. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. That's... Um, Daniel and Amos both have that idea. Chapter 3, the Lord said to me, now this is Hosea talking, go again and show your love for a woman who is committing adultery with a lover. Who do you think she is? You must love her just as I still love the people of Israel, even though they turn to other gods and like to take offerings of raisins to idols. So I paid 15 pieces of silver and 150 kilograms of barley to buy her. That's a month's wage. A month's wage. I told her that for a long time she would have to wait for me without being a prostitute or committing adultery, and during this time I would wait for her. And we'll go come back and talk about how God responds here, but we've got to keep moving on. Why wasn't she stoned? Yeah. I don't get that. Well, well everyone, everyone at that time, the whole city, the whole nation was involved in wickedness. Yeah. There was no one to stone yes. anyone. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah, one, to, I, I, no one to throw the first rock. <laughs> well, and, and look at this. I mean, that. seriously, did Hosea marry this woman because maybe she was the best one she could find? We look at this and, oh, no, look at this awful woman. Why did he marry this? She may have been the best woman he could find. Well, well you know, I mean, in light of what we read in chapter 4. God had her go into a cesspool to find a wife. Yeah. Well, you know, just like in the Garden of Eden, when Eve did that and Adam, uh, they sinned, God provided a way to, for them. It looks like even though um, God's people are becoming prostitutes, God is providing a way again. <laughs> it, it's if, if, if they respond. Yeah. Well, and if I might add, this, this book is obviously, it's very complex. God is definitely showing his anger against his people. And here in chapter 3, as you uh, just finished reading, uh, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord, Yahweh, loves the Israelites, mm -hmm. though they turn to other gods and love their sacred raisin cakes. The point is, we see this all throughout here. Yep. Let's not forget the... <laughs> In my opinion, the message here is that God loves his people, even though his people are wicked, continually turn against him. Yes. He's, even though he says, I'm abandoning you, you're out, he also says, I'm, I'm still here, I'm waiting. And the prophet, Hosea, that was his message, to tell the people to come back to the Lord. Yeah. The Lord is there for you. Don't abandon the Lord. And uh, so this, this book is very complex, obviously, but there, well, there is a love see, message here. What we see here is an incredible God reaching out to a people who were doing all those yes. things we read about yes. back in the beginning. Yes. Absolutely incredible. I agree Amazing. with that. And these things still continue today. We'd, oh, yeah. Yes. yes. But that's why I wonder if the Hosea is an allegory, a vision, is it because on one part he said the word of God was given unto him, or some people used through him, like he was speaking, God speaking through him. If, uh, but I agree with what you say, but sometimes I wonder if, if, if it's Well, real. in light of this, we need to keep moving because there's a lot more material we'd like to cover. Look at Leviticus 21, verse 7, what God's original plan was. A priest 
this would be any person working with God, I would presume, mm -hmm. shall not marry a woman who has been a prostitute or a woman who is not a virgin or who is divorced. He is holy. And to compare that with what was said later, much later, almost in the days of, of uh, well, 100 years after Hosea, Ezekiel 44, 22, no priest may marry a divorced woman. He is to marry only an Israelite virgin or the widow of another priest. That was what God planned to have happen. Now, before you said the word virgin meant young woman, does it mean young woman there? Virgin here in this verse? Um, no, it means virgin, I'm quite sure, yeah. There's a strange thing happening in Africa. Uh, men, grown men with HIV, they are raping babies. Mm -hmm. three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old babies because they believe having sex with a baby will take away the... Well, having a sex with someone, uh. having sex with someone who doesn't have HIV takes away your HIV. That's, that was one of the messages that... Hosea, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shameful. And mm -hmm. that's lack of knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not yeah. lack well, of scientific knowledge. Right. Okay. We're going to look at all those verses, hopefully, anyway. So you, when, you, when you asked about all those things, what you should do as far as a wife goes, you know, the priest or whatever, what, what's your point there? Uh, well, I'm just saying, you know, this isn't God's choice way of doing things. No. Obviously, this is a shocking, supposed to be shocking kind of thing to sort of grab people's attention. Okay. The whole I life see. of Hosea you're yeah. talking about. So, so even though God commanded him to do this, um, that's the reason. But because he's trying to yeah. make a point. Okay. And he's trying to make it. So now, we've, now we've seen enough of the history. We've seen Hosea's story a little bit. We, I read you the background. Okay, now let's pretend for a moment that each one of you is in the place of God. What would you do? With the people of Israel or with Hosea or the people of Israel? The people of Israel. I don't think I would be as patient as God, but... Um, you would take how, action a little bit Were sooner. there any good ones in there, like Noah? Well, like there's Job. Hosea. That might have been, you know, with the time of Isaiah, was it uh, Elijah? Elijah? Yeah. He said there's 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal, and the timing is not a whole lot different no. than what we got going no. here, so... Yeah, the whole history of the northern kingdom of Israel was about 150 years. But that's a creative way to teach, though. You gotta admit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes makes a good point. Yeah. So I I don't know what else you could do. Did they recognize the uh, meaning of the story that they were the prostitutes uh, and had gone from God? Did well, they recognize it? I think so. I th I think it was obvious. But we I don't know. Think we don't know where. There. See, we don't know where Hosea lived. We don't know whether he was in Samaria and he had a chance to speak to the people of Samaria at the headquarters of the, of the nation, or whether he's from one of the local villages. If he was from a small village, I mean, how many people, I mean, several questions. First of all, how many people would even know Hosea? Two, how many people would care about what was going on in his life? But he wrote a book. Yeah, which well, would be quite remarkable. there isn't much, much other history around that, yeah. around him. So he could have been a, a a well-known person, yeah. he could have had a lot of significance in, in what was going on, what the news was, and usually what people if, were saying, and what the opinions were. Usually, if that's the case, it will say, well, he was the secretary to the king, or he was the, you know, to give you an idea that, oh, yes, this guy has some impact. But I suspect that as a prophet, he was telling this story real time. Yeah. That he's saying, look, God has told me to go down and do this. And here's the reason, because mm -hmm. you are, and, and this story played out in real time. And I think an awful lot of Israel knew about it. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, obviously it didn't make much difference because within 10 years after most of this is happening, the nation's gone, finished. Well, that's the story of... Sinners, isn't yeah. it? I'm disease. <laughs> and you asked if we were, if any one of us was, was God, what would we do with Israel at this time? 
Well, the picture that much of the church has grown up with is send fire on them, burn them up. Yeah. Or drown them. Zap them. Yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever way, zap them. But what about this? Does God ever use lived out parables in the Bible? We have this story of Hosea. There's at least one major place in Isaiah, chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. Jeremiah, chapter 27, 1 to 17. And there's at least a dozen different cases in, in, the, in the book of Ezekiel. It's chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 12, chapter, two or three places. Chapter 21, chapter tw twice, chapter 24, chapter 37. And in Micah, the first chapter. So many, many times God used literally prophets to live out, I mean, walking around naked. But I mean, it's even, it's even bigger than that mm -hmm. because this whole story of Israel and their, their path mm -hmm. is given to us for the last days. It's and supposed so, to teach us. And we can, we're supposed to look at this history and, and see ourselves in it. Mm -hmm. Well, norm. here's... <laughs> <laughs> well, I so, we're like this. And, and I would ask, what is your life saying about God to those around you? I would say that Laodicea is described as blind, naked, miserable, wretched. That's pretty close to this. Can't we just all get along? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, God is a God of wanting to live out his words. I mean, Jesus was a living out of God's word, mm -hmm. and God wants us to be, our lives to yeah. be a living out. That's right. And so he makes his prophets, some of them living out uh, these examples. So, mm -hmm. and we're the theater of the universe. Right. So yeah. uh, that is God's way to live out. Well, this looks like a big soap opera. I mean, well, maybe a lot of people I will, mean, will um, start getting into it. You know, you, what's happened with Hosea lately? Well, you know, he did this and he called his, his next uh, son this, and you're kidding. We haven't even got so, to the end of Hosea's story. He mm -hmm. ends up having to go down to what we would now call the red light district and search around there in the brothels and the, you know, among the prostitutes to find his wife and bring her back home again. Of course, he must have done that all on his own. God wouldn't tell him to do that, would he? God told him to do that. And I'm at and my next question to you. What would happen if you saw your pastor wandering around among the brothels looking for his wife or even there for any other reason? But if he wrote a book and saying how this is related to what the people are doing. Like they just had the Academy Awards, yeah. the whole thing. They have this little statue and they're giving it to one another and all this glamour and stuff. And, and you just wonder, is that an idol? You know, mm -hmm. I, are we doing this now? Yeah, well, it's time for us to start asking some serious questions. In Hosea's day, the offerings and sacrifices and money that should have gone to the Levites in the temple in Jerusalem were going where? To the fertility cult shrines and temples on the hilltops. What would be an equivalent today? How different would be our situation as a church if every church member were paying a faithful tithe? What if each church member were correctly representing God? Now, I have a question. Um, this is in the section that doesn't have the temple. Mm -hmm. So Levites... The northern kingdom. And so... They can still go down there and worship. So they can... They were supposed to still give their money to the uh, temple? Uh, well, there were, were? there were... No, there were Levites scattered all through everywhere. The Levites weren't all around the temple. So there were some, actually some Levites still doing what was right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. In the northern kingdom. But we have to be careful. Remember that way back in Judges 19, the story of a Levite who lived in the northern kingdom and ended up with his, with his second wife cutting her up into pieces after she was dead in a sex orgy thing and she you know, started a war and so forth. That was a Levite from the north. Okay, so a percentage of the Levite. <laughs> 
a percentage of the Levites <laughs> were still good. Mess. Of all the people, how, what percentage do you think were still? Oh, man. Well, uh, what did Elijah say? He says, I'm the only one left. I'm the only, he lived there. He says, I'm the only one left. And that was way before this time. But God said, he was. there are 7,000 yeah. that mm -hmm. have not bowed to Baal. Mm -hmm. And they were in the background. Well, they were just the people that, the common people, some of them had hung on to God's ways. Well, the question we need to ask today is, if everyone in the church were just like you, how well would the church be doing? The book of Hosea presents an incredible contrast. On the one hand, we read about God's appeal to Hosea for the people to stop and think about what they were doing and to return to him and he would take them back. I mean, they had plenty of history to see what would happen if they were faithful to God and plenty of history to see what would happen if they weren't unfaithful to God. On the other hand, we read about the dire consequences of not doing so. How much more can God do for these people? At what point does God have to say, I'm sorry, there's nothing more I can do for you? God's always ready to take us back, but are we willing to come back? Or are we too attached? Now, forgive me, I'm talking about the 21st century now, yeah. A.D., not B.C. Are we too attached to our sins? God will never force us to come back. By the way, as a side note, if you're interested in looking at these materials and all the documentation that we're talking about here, those things are available on our website, uh, theox.org, www.theox, T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G, and you can get this handout that we're discussing today. One of the uh, things that God doesn't do is when we do something bad, He doesn't immediately slap our hand mm -hmm. or something so that we would quickly know we can't. What He lets us do is use our own, our own morals, our own morality to correct ourselves. Our own and thinking. The punishment isn't until down the road. And so then we think that there's no punishment for doing this because like in school, we didn't get wrapped with a ruler right away. So, and God gives us enough rope that we hang ourselves. So does and, God need to wrap us with a ruler? <laughs> um, that would have a different kind of God. Then we'd know that we were going to be wrapped with a ruler all the time. So if but we weren't God, wrapped with a ruler, we'd know we were doing okay? Um, are you saying over time? Well, well I'm God. Right at the moment. God, uh, God wants people who can live in heaven without having to be wrapped with a ruler. That's right. Um, yeah. So, am I doing okay now? I think I should have been wrapped with a ruler a couple times today. <laughs> well, look at Hosea 2, starting with verse 12. God is doing everything he possibly can to reach out to these people. And here's his words. I will destroy Israel's grapevines and her fig trees, which she said her lovers gave her for serving them. I will turn her vineyards and orchards into a wilderness. Wild animals will destroy them. I will punish her for the times that she forgot me when she burned incense to Baal and put on her jewelry to go chasing after her lovers. The Lord has spoken. But a is, is God threatening them? Is he... Is this God going to do this? Or is it saying this is going to happen when I step back? This is, this is what's going to happen to you. That's my question. Is, is this... this God letting out enough rope so that they can hang mm. themselves? Verse 12, first words, I will destroy her grapevines. It doesn't say they will destroy their own grapevines. It makes it sound like God is taking an active role. It does. I think he is willing to take that position. But does he really that's, do that? That, that's that would question. be a good question. That's, that's, to, that's, that's a question we need to answer. Well, that's, one thing's for, him, for sure. He, he let it happen. Yes. yes. So He had... It, ultimately, he has control That's right. of them. It got past his passive will. So it, when it happens to someone because they hung themselves, God is taking responsibility and saying, I did it. I provided the rope. I provided the rope. That's right. 
And in this uh, book right where we were in chapter 2, verse 14, it kind of seems like Hosea, the book of Hosea, is God wrapping us with the ruler. Wake up, get right. And then, of course, after those uh, ominous things mentioned just before in verse 14, therefore I am going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert, speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards. And uh, moving over to uh, partially down into 15, there she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. So he's, all, he's there. He's trying to get us back in the 21st century. He's trying to get them back there throughout history. God loves us. Yes, sometimes he speaks harshly to us, but he loves us. Don't fall away from him. If you do, come back to him. He's still there. To me, the book of Hosea says he's there. Don't fall away. Mm -hmm. Do follow him. But no matter what, come to him. Well, now let me ask you some questions. Considering what we've talked about the background, do you think Gomer, Hosea's wife, had attached herself to one of the fertility cult temples? Or was she literally, had she literally attached herself to some kind of a pimp who was selling her services for a profit? How can we tell and that? How, yeah, and that's my next question. I mean, what happens when, you, when, when that kind of behavior comes so close to religion that you can't tell for sure what's, which is which? Well, it, it does say, I believe it was in, uh, well, at any rate, in one of the chapters here, it does say, purchase her back. Mm -hmm. That's chapter 3. So that sounds like a pimp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's we all the same the stuff pimp. anyway. Well, you could yes. be employed. Yes, you could be employed by the church and he would purchase her back from the church. The church could have employed all these women and men or whoever they employed. Your parallel well, in Hosea's day. Oh. <laughs> oh. In Hosea's day, men had all the authority. Women were often considered nothing more than property. In that light, what did the neighbors and friends think of Hosea's act in going after Gomer? Yeah. I, was I mean, didn't he have church grounds for divorce? Yeah. Shouldn't he have just looked for another wife? But I was saying Well, that's this. what God would be doing then if, to Israel. He would be looking for another wife then, but she, he was still going after them, trying so what, to get him to come back. What's the parallel of another wife? God's looking for another nation, another people? Well, Us? just like he could have with, with Moses, remember? Re, let me destroy these guys, and, and um, I'll raise you a nation up, Moses. He could have well, been doing the same thing happened? again. He was teaching Moses there. Yeah. But what happened here? I'm, maybe I was misunderstood. The temple prostitutes had to all be hanging around the temple for a reason. Either they were employed or uh, they earned money. So, Or they were okay. fed. Or they were fed. Okay. Just take, fed and taken care of. It, it said she got, it, it yeah. named the things that she got yeah, from, yeah, and then she was going to go collect those things because yeah. that <laughs> was important. Well... What are we supposed to learn about God in all of this? Look at some passages. Just turn to, to chapter 4 and the, read the first few verses. The Lord has an accusation to bring against the people who live in this land. Listen, Israel, to what he says. There is no faithfulness or love in the land, and the people do not acknowledge me as, the, as God. They make promises and break them. They lie, murder, steal, and commit adultery. Crimes increase, and there is one murder after another. It sounds almost like you're reading the newspaper today, doesn't it? And so the land will dry up and everything that lives on it will die. All the animals and birds and even the fish will die. Is God making a threat there? No, he's Warning. describing the way it will be after he comes. Well, but who controls the rains? Huh? We'll drop down to verse 17, which we already looked at this once. The people of Israel are under the spell of idols. Let them go their own way. After drinking much wine, they delight in their prostitution, preferring disgrace to honor. They will be carried away as by the wind, and they will be ashamed of their pagan sacrifices. And one more passage that goes with that, which we need to look at, and that's chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 6. Turn over there, if you will. This gives us a hint. 
Um, and let me start with verse 5. That is why I have sent my prophets to you with my message of judgment and destruction. What I want from you is plain and clear. I want your constant love, not your animal sacrifices. I would rather have pe my people know me than burn offerings to me. Now, if you know something about Hebrew parallelism, what, is, uh, what does this mean? Well, clearly the animal sacrifices belong with the burnt offerings to me, right? So I, would, uh, so I want your constant love is parallel to I would rather have people know me. So what is he saying here? He's saying if you really knew God, you would love him. So what is that saying about all these people in Israel's day? In Hosea's day? They didn't care to study about God or know him anymore. They had virtually no knowledge of the truth, truth about God. So it was, it was a pretty sad situation. Um, Ellen White comments about it in, in the book Testimonies for Church, Volume 2. Poor rich men professing to serve God are objects of pity. While they profess to know God and works, they deny him. How great is the darkness of such. They profess faith in the truth, but their works do not correspond with their profession. The love of riches makes men selfish, exacting, and overbearing. Wealth is power, and frequently the love of it depraves and paralyzes all that is noble and godlike in man. Could that possibly be describing anybody living in our day? <laughs> Do we know the truth about God today? Do we know the correct picture of God as presented by Jesus from his time here on this earth? Do we know the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit as we should? Um, well, Jesus uh, says in John, it says in John 17, to know the Father and the Son is eternal life. Mm -hmm. So that means that we need to know the truth about God. We need to be perfectly clear on that. In, 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 in conclusion, in our last few seconds that we have, does this book tell us that God is intolerant of sin? If so, why? Can we learn to love sinners while we hate sin as God does? Do we really believe that sin is deadly? Could we become intolerant of sin? The book of Hosea is an incredible experience. We'll look at some more aspects of the book of Hosea next week. Plan to be with us at that time. The story gets even greater. See you then.